Praise be to God, my dear friends, Father Clay Hunt, the cowboy priest here, reporting to you from old Mexico, from Chihuahua. And I want to say that we love you very, very, very much, big time. And I love Mexico and I love the people of Mexico, probably some of the best people in the whole world. Me encanta la tierra de Mexico y la gente de Mexico. Y son ellos uno de los mejores en todo el mundo por la habilidad que tienen intelectualmente en sus corazones, en sus cuerpos. Son una gente de gran fe y siempre estoy rezando por México y especialmente con mis dos pies en la tierra de México que pueden esa gran gente a escapar de la esclavitud de las ideologías de los marxistas, de los ideologías de los ideologías de caminismo en que son como unos grandes cadenas ponen la gente en esclavitud es justo there's many many injustices that take place to these people because long ago more than a century plus they embraced the lies of the Marxists. They embraced the lies of the ideologies of communism. And therefore they, they have been sorely oppressed and are sorely oppressed. But we pray for the liberation of God to these beautiful people. Que el Señor va a poner de nuevo en la libertad, la gran gente de, es, de esta tierra y que pueden vivir en la plenitud de la luz y la libertad, la bendición de los hijos de Dios. And I'm going to share with you here some beautiful teachings as I tell you the Lord's blessing to us his speaking to us is always right on time in the liturgy <clears throat> and so we're gonna look at excerpts from the liturgy in these last few days jesus christ is risen today alleluia our triumphant holy day alleluia who did once upon the cross alleluia suffer to redeem our loss Alleluia. Hymns of praise, then let us sing. Alleluia. Unto Christ, our heavenly King. Alleluia. Who endured the cross and grave? Alleluia. Sinners to redeem and save. Alleluia. But the pains which he endured, Alleluia. 
our salvation have procured. Alleluia. Now he rules eternal King. Alleluia. Where the angels ever sing. Alleluia. Praise to God the Father sing. Alleluia. Praise to God the Son, our King. Alleluia. Praise to God the Spirit be. Alleluia. Now and through eternity. Alleluia. Praise be to God. We love the beauty of God's creation as you see la, la sierra extendida detrás de mí. The mountains of the Lord that show forth, they show forth the glory of the Lord. And even as the sun passes this morning, it's a, a little bit cloudy. But in the mornings as the sun shines down on the mountains and the clouds pass by, it paints a picture that's beautiful and different every time. And all of God's creatures give glory to the Lord with the rising of the sun in the morning. Praise God. How magnificent the Lord. And it's true that we find ourselves in binds or in hardships. And the Lord was the one who said recently in the liturgy in these past few days, in the world you will have trouble. I believe it was yesterday. He said, in the world you will have trouble, but do not do not be afraid, I have conquered the world. And that's our hope. And as we read the Psalms and see the, the happenings of old in the liturgies that we read, we recognize that there has always been tremendous trouble. Shoot, in these days, you know, in the first readings of these days from the Acts of the Apostles, which is the accounts of the early church. Listen to what happens. Trouble within the people of God, within the faith, meaning within the, the structure of the edifice of the people of God, which is to say, as a precursor, the church. Listen to how it says in that day. Let's see here. All of these days, the readings have been from the Acts of the Apostles. It says, The high priest rose up and all his companions, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the public jail. And then we go to the next day, Thursday. When the court officers had brought the, the apostles in and made them stand before the Sanhedrin, the high priests questioned them. We gave you strict orders because they're always ordering and looking at this thing and that thing. We gave you strict orders, <clears throat> they said, to stop teaching in, in that name, that is, in the name of Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and want to bring this man's blood upon us. Why? Were the apostles liars? No. 
It was the religious leaders to God's people, to the covenant of Moses, to the covenant of Abraham, who with their own hands and with their own actions put Jesus to death. And what we're dealing with in our time, the modern day Sadducees, the modern day high priests, the modern day Pharisees, they're exponentially worse in their intention and in their capability than the religious leaders of old. And that's why you see that all hell has broken loose on the face of the earth. And every hell that we're experiencing upon the face of the earth is in direct attribution <clears throat> to the negation in the largest part of these modern day Pharisees to fulfill their primary role and purpose. That is the teaching office of the church. That's the primary problem. And then secondarily, their own actions. Horrible horrible. They're responsible for every single problem in the whole world. And especially from the United States, since the U.S. is a world power. And much of, of the, the policies and the, the laws and the way of life of our country is directly uh, spawned, if you will, <laughs> spawned from their actions and lack of action. So we're in the bind or the spot that we're in because of the modern day high priests, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, Sanhedrin, and scholars of the law. These guys are wicked and you need to understand that so that you will not be taken off guard or to ask, how can that possibly be? You see how they are governed by passions of their own, governed by their own plan instead of the plan of God, governed by their own wicked ideas and plans. That's why we find ourselves in the spot that we're in. Listen to the first reading today. A Pharisee in the Sanhedrin named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people. And he was the one who told his, his uh, companions as a true wisdom. It was a true wisdom. He told them, don't, don't continue like this. You know, It's going to only bring trouble to you. It's going to only bring trouble to you. Do not continue with the wicked designs that you, that you have intention because you will find yourselves in opposition to God. You will find yourselves in opposition to the work of the Lord, but they didn't care about that, nor do they care. <clears throat> there are a few Gamaliels in our own time, you know, a few who sound the alarm, who, a few who are faithful, a few who have good intention and even to the highest order of true wisdom, like the ones we celebrate in these days. Yesterday we celebrated the feast of St. Stanislaus. When you look in the measure of time, he was exactly in the midpoint of where we are from the beginning of the church until this time. And he was a beautiful bishop. And, and that gives us confidence that, in fact, it's possible to have holy bishops. And there have been holy bishops, but we're just in the, tremendous, the most tremendous time of poverty as far as those things goes. I wish, and you can pray to God, to raise up a St. Stanislaus, to raise up a St. Martin I that we celebrate tomorrow, to raise up a St. Anselm, that we celebrate in just a few short 10 days, that to raise up for us good and holy bishops to shepherd his people and to put the house of God in order because it is in absolute disarray. Listen to the cry of the psalmist, which is reflected in our hearts in these days. 
These are the words from the liturgy of the hours this morning, the office of readings. Psalm 38, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger. And it's true that we have our own part in it. Sometimes people tell me, Father, also tell the laity how they're responsible for these things. Heck yeah, they are. We are accountable to God for, as he said, to the last penny. And so these words are true. Do not rebuke me in your anger, Lord. Do not punish me in your rage. Because the Lord's rage is against us and justly for our sins. I myself am a sinner. I don't make any, any kind of illusion that I'm not. And, and I grieve for my sins. And I realize that my own sins contribute to the, to the state of the union. To, to the, the horrible place in which we find Holy Mother Church right now. I'm a contributing factor for the sins of, of my life and that I continue to commit. But I desire to be holy to God. And I make repentance. And I make, uh, you know, prayers of atonement and, and sacrifices of atonement on behalf of of God's people on behalf of the church. And I do believe in God with my whole heart, which in all that poverty means something to God. In, in all the shortcomings that the little cowboy priest has, it means something to God to, to have faith and to believe and to try, as St. Paul said, to fight the good fight, even though sometimes we fall short. He was the one who said, you know, oftentimes I fall into the offense, the sin of that which I tried to avoid. And when I try to do the good, so many times I fall down. That's, that's a perfect uh, explanation of, of how we are. But we never stop fighting the good fight. Or as he said, we run the race to the end. So the psalmist continues, Your arrows have sunk deep in me. Your hand has come down upon me, Lord. Through your anger, all my body is sick through my sin. There is no health in my limbs. My guilt towers higher than my head. It is a weight too heavy for me to bear. My wounds are foul and festering, the result of my own folly. I am bowed and brought to my knees. I go mourning all the day long. And that's true. Lord, look upon your people and their tremendous sufferings. I was just, uh, you know, in this beautiful land, in this beautiful people, there has been tremendous suffering. I was talking to this man just last night on these mountains that are behind me and the insidious wickedness of the cartels, guys that they call sicarios. One of them attacked his dad and bound his hands behind his back and stole some of the few possessions that the poor man had. And thanks be to God, he didn't take his life. But it was just, he went crossing those mountains there on foot and came upon another little ranch in which in fact he did take the life of another man and stole his vehicle and continued down the Sierra until, praise the Lord, some days later they, they cornered him in his hiding and, and they put his life to a just end for all the wickedness he had done. But there are many injustices that take place in our lives and in this world and in places they shouldn't come from and in places they shouldn't come from all around us. These are tremendous days of injustice. But we cry aloud to you, Lord, Oh Lord, you know our longing. My groans are not hidden from you. Save your people, Lord. 
my heart throbs and my strength is spent. Every light has gone from my eyes. My friends avoid me like a leper. And those closest to me stand afar off. Those who plot against my life lay snares. Those who seek my ruin speak of harm, planning treachery all the day long. There are people with wicked and evil intentions, gente de maldad. But I am like the deaf who cannot hear, like the dumb, unable to speak. I am like a man who hears nothing and whose mouth has no defense. Lord, save me from my own unknowing. Give me a mind that is able to understand and to penetrate the breadth and depth and length and height of wisdom that you have revealed. That is the deposit of faith. Give me the wisdom to sound all these measurements that are proper to it and to grasp and to be able to speak a word to rouse your people and plant in their own minds the ability to grasp these sacred mysteries. I count on you, Lord. It is you, Lord God, who answer. You will be the one to answer. I pray, do not let them mock me. Those who triumph, if my foot should slip, Lord, do not do not let the designs of the wicked triumph. For I am on the point of falling, and my pain is always before me. I confess my guilt and my sins fill me with dismay. My wanton em enemies are numberless and my lying foes are many. They repay me evil for good and attack me for seeking what is right. O oh Lord, do not forsake me. My God, do not stay afar off. Make haste and come to my help. O oh Lord, my God, my savior. That's absolutely true. And that is the sentiment we feel as I talk to these people, beautiful Mexican people, in the place where I'm from and in every place. Next week I'm going to, Lord have mercy, Baltimore, Maryland. Talk about a, talk about a hellhole of ideology. Talk about a, a den of thieves, talk about a, a snake's den. That's that place. Totally ridden, totally riddled and consumed with the cancers of wickedness of men and women. <laughs> and women. You don't get off the hook, ladies. Your bad behaviors are mounting up to the very heights to the sky. I was talking to this man here who he was in marriage and his wife was communicating to other men and come to find out she had been spreading herself out like a prostitute to every man, every passerby. And that's common in these days. Women of these days, harlotry, harlots. God bless their little children, two beautiful children. And their father is resolved, thanks be to God, to, to raise them in the path of truth and to love them more than he loves himself. But that's, that's a terrible place that the world has found itself in because of Eve, the ancient sin of Eve, and she's committing that sin in massive, in a massive and intentional way in, in our own time. And the enemy doesn't even have to work hard for that. Not only is 
she deceived, but she gives herself into deception freely. There's nothing worse than the harlotry of women. Very destructive to creation. And that's why we have to recognize two truths and there's an urgency to these times. All this week long, all this week long from the Office of Readings has been from the Book of Revelation. Apocalyptical things. Threatening the violence of the Lord upon His creation by the powers of angels and by the authority of the Lord Himself. And that's why there's, a, there's, there's an urgency to, to have conversion in our own life and to bring others to conversion. In my encounters, with people here, amazingly, there's a, a couple who have been married more than 40 years, but not by the blessing of God. As we say in Spanish, solamente por civil, by the laws of men. That don't mean nothing to God. So they've been walking in the desert for more than 40 years. But through the grace of God and the efforts of the poverty of his missionaries, this couple is going to go talk to the priest in this week. And negotiate to secure that they will be able to stand before the altar of the Lord hand in hand and to exchange their vows and to bring the blessing of God upon their love to one another and upon their family. And in that, it w in that, that I told these people to go see the priest. In fact, one member of the family already went to the Holy Confession. And his children, it is his intention to put in line to the doctrina, to have the catechism, to learn the faith, and to make the first Holy Communion, and to renew their life to God. That's the work that we're about me and you, the work of building up the kingdom of heaven, the work of evangelization, the work of bringing people to the salvific efficacy of the sacramental life. And that's, that's what is our angle in relationship to all things. That is what is our angle, our end game, our motivation. And we have to be about that work because in fact, there is a sense of urgency. Listen to the words of St. John, the, the evangelist and the sacred author recorded in the book of Revelation. This is the first reading of the office of readings from today. I, John, had another vision. Above me there was an open door in heaven. And I heard the trumpet-like voice which had spoken to me before. It said, come up here and I will show you what, it, what must take place in time to come. At once I was caught up in ecstasy. A throne was standing there in heaven. And on the throne was seated one whose appearance had a gem-like sparkle as of jasper and carnelian. Around the throne was a rainbow of brilliant as emerald. Surrounding this throne were 24 other thrones upon which were seated the 24 elders. That's the 12, the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles the foundation and the pillars of the covenant of God to his people. Amazing. 
the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. And that's what we follow to the teaching of our ancestors and the teaching of the, the, the apostles. When I encounter people who are offended, you know, saying, no, que esta diciendo este sacerdote o este obispo que están diciendo mentiras o cosas falsos o cosas de como está pensando el mundo. They don't know nothing about the truth. That's why we don't, it's like, like in the, in the liturgy in these past days that we'll read from the gospels yesterday or from the, from the Acts of the Apostles, when those high priests seized upon Peter and the Apostles, you know, making these, these, uh, you know, irrational and uh, illegitimate demands upon the Apostles. They said, the Apostles said, well, you know, it's better for us to be faithful to God than to things of man, these foolish things that you're saying. And people have that sense. People are, they become angry and they become disenfranchised. But that's why we have to fight to negotiate to the people. As I often tell people that nothing of this world or out of this world will separate you from the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. Because that's the end game of the enemy by whatever means to separate the human person from the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. And that's why we got to be sharp because our truest enemy is not that faithless bishop or that faithless priest, but our true enemy is the devil himself. And that's why we have to be very, very careful. We don't have the freedom to say, no, I don't go to church anymore because they're hypocrites. We don't have the freedom to say, I don't go to church anymore because of the bad behaviors of this people or that bishop or that priest. We don't go to church for or because of any human person. It's for the Lord himself. And that's why it is necessary for for us to understand the foundation of who we are and what defines to who we are. The heads of the 12 tribes of Israel and the pillars of the 12 apostles, the deposit of faith. They were there clothed in white garments and had crowns of gold upon their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and peals of thunder before, before it burned seven flaming torches, the seven spirits of God. The floor around the throne was like a sea of glass, that it was crystal clear. At the very center, around the throne itself stood four living creatures covered with eyes front and back. And the first creature resembled a lion, the second an ox, the third had the face of a man, while the fourth looked like an eagle in flight. An eagle! Each of the four living creatures had six wings and eyes all over inside and out, day and night. Without pause, they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, He who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. And this imagery that's given, you know, just like this past week, we had the eclipse of the sun just three days ago or four days ago. Everybody went crazy in the whole world. <laughs> you had people coming from all over the world to my beloved Texas, the great state of Texas. God bless Texas. You had fool, foolish people for coming from all over the world, spending big monies and putting that at the center of their, of their intention and their lives for even a long time. I was talking to this beautiful man who 
cuts my hair. There ain't a, a lot of hair for him to cut, but he does the best that he can. And he was like, you know, even if, you know, they said, he was saying how people so foolishly are making all these efforts to, to come from far and wide. And he said, you know, it's only a short distance from here to San Antonio. If they said the center of the, the, the path, of full eclipse was to pass through San Antonio. I wouldn't even go to San Antonio for that. I mean, what? To look up in the sky and see for like, you know, a minute or a few seconds, you know, an eclipse and everybody's like, ooh, ooh. You know, and what's going to happen? What about this? All these speculations and everything. Stupid and foolish people. What do you think? will be your response whenever you see the description of the kingdom of heaven that was just given by St. John. My goodness. Oh, stupid and foolish people. And that's why we got to make it our business to think in the way of God, to live in the way of God, to make that our way of life for ourselves and for our family. And that's why these readings from the Holy Gospel in the last few days is so important from Thursday that was yesterday the the antiphon from the gospel was pointedly and precisely to that it said it's this is the Lord speaking you believe Thomas because you have seen me says the Lord blessed are those who have not seen but still believe we have to have faith you remember how Thomas said in that way you remember how Thomas said in that way he told to the other apostles they said we have seen the Lord he has risen and Thomas told them I will not believe in, until I put my finger into the nail prints in his hand and until I put my hand in his side. In a way, in a certain way of arrogance. I mean, Thomas was a man of faith. And a beautiful apostle. But there was a certain arrogance and a certain, you know, raw arrogance of humanity. In the words he spoke like that. And that's why a week later, when the apostles were gathered together. And this time Thomas was with them. And the Lord came into their midst and he told to Thomas, Come here, boy. Put your finger into the nail marks in my hand. And put your hand into my side. That you may not be unbelieving, but believing. And that's the same for us. Even in our innocence, it is offensive to God, our lack of faith. And that's why we have to push ourselves. And we have to push our families to be a people of faith. And to understand that there is an urgency in our time. And that there are consequences. And that nothing compares to the greatness explained so eloquently by John. In his descriptions of the kingdom of heaven. Like jasper and carnelian. Crystal clear as water was the floor. And the four living creatures that had eyes to see everything. Nothing escapes the notice of the Lord. Everything is known. And that's why we have to strive for perfection. While we have life breath within us. And to be beautiful as we can be. You know, I see, I went into a church yesterday. I love the colonial churches of Mexico. I was offended as we went in different towns. And there were the modernists edifices there. Churches that were built like in the late 60s, in the 70s and 80s. As we would say in Spanish, bien feo trash they look terrible i love 
the beautiful and sacred architecture of the colonial times. And there are magnificent churches like that. I was just looking at the 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 magnificent woodwork that that was on the ceiling of the church, high vaulted ceiling, stretching high, inviting these poor people to look up to God. And I don't know who the artist was and obviously, you know, it when I was looking at it, it wasn't to perfection, but it was magnificent. Timbers, great timbers, and they weren't exactly straight. There was a curvature in them, but it was magnificent and detailed love work and beautiful, fitting to give honor and glory to God. That's why I love Mexico. And there are the roots of faith here. That's why we have to reclaim the faith. As I was driving on the carretera, the highway, I would see from place to place on hills planted the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, we have to live by that banner to proclaim boldly and to walk in the ways of the Christ. That was the second reading today listen listen dear people and let it be imprinted upon your hearts this was from a sermon by Saint Theodore the Studite titled the precious and life-giving cross of Christ and that's why we have to reject the the foolishness of the world who rejects the cross. Anybody who rejects the cross ain't no friend of mine because my friend is the Lord and I stand with the Lord and I walk with the Lord and that has to be our way. How precious, he said, is the gift of the cross. How splendid to contemplate. In the cross there is no mingling of good and evil. We don't, we don't put up with evil. There's not a, a mingling of good and evil as in the tree of paradise. It is holy, meaning completely beautiful to behold and good to taste. The fruit of this tree is not death, but life, not darkness, but light. This tree does not cast us out of paradise, but opens the way for us to return. This was the tree on which Christ, like a king on his chariot, destroyed the devil. And the Lord, the Lord of death, and freed the human race from his tyranny. Amen. That's our freedom. That's the way to, to escape this slavery that we experience in the whole of the world because of the enemy, the devil the king of death. This was the tree on which Christ the king hung. This was the tree upon which the Lord, like a brave warrior, wounded in hands, feet, and side, healed the wounds of sin and, and evil, the evil serpent, that the evil serpent had inflicted on nature. I just received this morning a communications from some man that I don't know, but he communicated to me on the Instagram that he's praying for me. And he said, Father, I just came into the sacramental life of the church on Easter Sunday past. I just was confirmed in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, wow, how magnificent. I told him, I'm so proud of you. And that's true. These, these freedoms were won by the sacrifice of the cross on our behalf by Christ. This was the tree which the Lord, like a brave warrior, wounded in his hands, feet, and side, healed the wounds of sin that the evil serpent had inflicted upon our nature. A tree once 
caused our death and now a tree brings life. The tree that deceived the first Eve and the first man. Once deceived by a tree, we are now repelled. We have now repelled the cunning serpent by a tree. That's why we love the cross. And that's why God blessed the people of Mexico. And that they may be renewed strongly to be a people of faith. What an astonishing transformation. What an astonishing transformation that death should come, become life. That decay should become immortality. That shame should become glory. Well might the holy apostle exclaim, Far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And that's why I told to this man that I was talking to yesterday, I don't fear anything of this world. I don't look for trouble. I don't desire trouble. I desire good. I desire to be at peace. I desire every good for myself, my family, and for everyone. But I don't fear evil. And I don't fear the cross. I don't fear what is the only road to glory. And that's the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even if it were to require my life blood, like the beautiful Saint Stanislaus yesterday, bishop and martyr, I was making my prayers to God saying, Lord, don't ever let me deny what's true. If I'm put into a bind which required the spilling of my own life blood, which would be traumatic, and absolutely nothing like anything I've ever experienced before, that your grace would hold me up and that I would be, faith, be able to be faithful to the end, that I would be able to go all the way with it like my Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not only to the radical imagery that I just shared with you. For example, if some of these facades of strength, sicarios. They don't have strength. They're abusers of power. And they're, how would you say, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Opportunists. They capitalize on wicked opportunities to catch innocent men in the dark. Let's say if I was to be captured by these sickos and tortured, that would be absolutely traumatic. And that's, a, that's an imagery that's hard to, to even fathom, to think of. But there is the daily carrying of the cross that we call the white martyrdom. And it is equally intense even though not sense perceptible very often times, but equally intense in our call to live that one way or another, we carry the cross with our Lord Jesus Christ. How beautiful the sweetness of the cross. And we have to tell God with our own mouths that we are willing to walk with him the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross that we are willing to suffer and even to be crucified with him for the sake of truth in our lives and truth that stands by itself. That we are resolved to stand with truth. The supreme wisdom that flowered on the cross has shown the folly of the worldly wisdom's pride. The world don't know nothing about nothing. Like I said of Father James Martin the other day, that homosexual priest, that wicked man, he ain't even a man. He might even be a transgender. He might be the first woman ordained to the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although there's no such possibility, it wouldn't surprise me if such a thing happened. He ain't no man at all. And I said, in truth, he don't know shit from Shinoah. And that's absolutely true. 
That's absolutely true. And that's why we have to make it our business to not have anything to do with the worldly wisdom's pride. The knowledge of all good, which is the fruit of the cross, has cut away the shoots of wickedness. Amen. The wonders accomplished through this tree were foreshadowed clearly, even by the mere types and figures that existed in the past. Meditate on these. If you are too, if you are eager to learn, if you have the sense to be eager to learn, was it not the wood of that tree that enabled Noah at God's command to escape the destruction of the flood together with his sons, his wives, together with his sons, his wife, his sons, wives, and every kind of animal? Do you not love your family? Are you so myopic <coughs> that you don't think of tomorrow or for the tomorrow of forever? Are you so short-sighted that you don't see anything but your own designs, your own pleasures? Oh, stupid and foolish people, wake up. And surely the rod of Moses prefigured the cross when it changed water into blood swallowed up the false serpents of Pharaoh's magicians, divided the sea at one stroke, and then restored the waters to the normal course, drowning the enemy and saving God's people. It is through the cross lifted up our Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation. And that's why we don't reject the cross. Come on, people. Have some substance of faith. Aaron's rod, which blossomed in one day in proof of his true priesthood, priest of the covenant of old, God bless Aaron, was another figure of the cross. And did not Abraham foreshadow the cross when he bound his son Isaac, placed him on a pile of wood? We have to be willing to put the things of, of the Lord above everything else of this world, even to what is most sacred and beautiful to us, even to what is most important in our lives. God first, or you're going to get lost every time. By the cross, death was slain and Adam was restored to life. The cross is the glory of all the apostles, the crown of the martyrs, the sanctification of the saints. By the cross, we put on Christ and cast aside our former self. Amen. Rise up, people of God, to the cross. Love the cross. Embrace it and kiss it in your lives. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And the false notions of the world hold no power to you. How did St. Paul say, Oh, death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? You ain't got nothing. By the cross, we, the sheep of Christ, have been gathered into one flock. God, vindicate your holy bride, the church, the one flock gathered to you. Vindicate your holy bride walking the way of the cross on this earth to the sheepfolds of the kingdom of heaven. To the sheepfolds of the kingdom of heaven. Shepherd us, O Lord. And in fin, how does he shepherd us? Listen to the wisdom of the holy gospel from yesterday. from the Gospel of St. John. The one who comes from above is above all. True that. The one who is of the earth is of earthly things and speaks of earthly things. But the one who comes from heaven is above all and he testifies to what 
he has seen and heard. But no one accepts his testimony. Whoever does accept his testimony certifies that God is trustworthy. And surely he is trustworthy. He does not ration his gift of the Spirit. That's why it is so necessary for us to live in the sacramental life. It is not just something that, that gives us just enough to get by. It is not rationed. The portion of the Spirit of the Lord that we receive in the sacraments. It is plena, full. And it is at disposition for us to live in. That's why we have to live as men and women, boys and girls, and for the sake of, of those whom we love to be true to the sacramental life, which brings eternal life. For whoever disobeys the Son will not see life. That is the threat against us. That is the threat against us. We are not like the world. As the gospel for today says, those people were following Jesus, he said, because you want to see signs. You have seen that the Son of Man has healed people. And so you flock to me. But blessed are those who have purity of intention. Blessed are those who come to the Lord for the sake of truth. Because as the Gospel Antiphon said for today, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And that is true. His word is our salvation. And even it is made sense perceptible and tangible in what I'm preparing to celebrate right now. That's the Holy Mass, the Eucharist. And that's why Father Clay, imperfect as he is, never misses one day of the Holy Mass. And if you had any wisdom of all the things that we have spoken of, that is at the summit, the apex. It is for the sake of the covenant new and everlasting that everything we spoke of is true. And it is from that covenant new and everlasting that it is possible to achieve all the things of which we have spoken of today. And that's why I hope you tremendously and profoundly renew your your life in the sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. Did you make it your business to be accustomed to expose yourself to the sacraments, the Holy Confession, and to eat the bread of angels, the bread from heaven? That's the only surety of victory. I hope that you can understand these things. And even though whether you speak English or Spanish or German, as some people in this country of Mexico do, that you understand the one language that is true to all things, that perdures in every age, and that permeates all of creation anew every single day. The sacramental life of Holy Mother Church. From Mexico, the fullness of the love of my heart, the Lord be with you. And through the intercession of the holy bishops to God, Stanislaus, Martin I, and Anselm, and the countless others that mark the passing of time through the centuries and through the ages. May Almighty God bless you that in this time, the new time, our time, the time pertinent to us and to our eternal life, may the Lord be the one to bless you. May God hear your prayers. May He give you strength. And may every grace of the resurrection be afforded to you anew. The Father the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Adios. Bye.